Testing, check, check, one, two, three. All right, welcome to the Ninja Robot Studio LLC stream where I play video games and VR experiences and talk through them from a UX designer's perspective. Game development has a heavy and direct influence on XR development, so it makes sense that we would study game design to give us a better understanding of how to design quality immersive experiences. The plan is to have all of you in chat participate and that way we can learn together make your comments, ask your questions, and if you're watching this later on YouTube, make your comments on YouTube, and I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. And there are a lot of classes out there on UX design and UX processes, and more and more classes are coming out around designing for XR. Um, think of this as a kind of an unofficial and less academic and less expensive university labs class for UX for XR. Uh, we're going to use critical thinking in our design and analysis, and my goal is to help you gain experience in this process as you participate in the chat. Um, check out the widgets on my Twitch page under the About section, and you'll see a section called Rose Thorn Bud. And we'll be using this method each session to think through the games that I'm playing. And this is experimental, and I'll learn and iterate on the format as I go and as you guys give me feedback. So let me, for those of you who are watching this on YouTube later, let me show you what I'm talking about on Twitch. Give me a moment. Turn on my browser. There we go. Um, the, on my about page on Twitch, you'll see this section called Rose Thorn Bud. And I don't know if you can see my mouse. It doesn't look like you can. Let me try to fix that. Sorry, I'm trying to fix it. Give me a second. See if that actually works. Still can't see it. Okay. Oh, there it is. Okay. So, this is the Rose Thorn Bud method. And this is the method that I'm talking about. And you have it here for quick reference. And for those of you who don't know who I am, I am Aletha Singleton. Um, I create content around UX for XR. And I've created this website called UX for XR Toolkit that gives you the basics, the very basics of UX for XR best practices. And you can dive deeper with videos. And I am creating a pattern library of design patterns that you can use as reference to see how other people have solved problems that you're trying to solve in your projects. That is a growing library that I am working on adding more content later. And if you want to support those efforts, you can support me on Patreon. The link is here. Um, and you can also gain access to early access to stuff as I create it by becoming a patron. And I wanted to talk about quickly this new thing, this new services that new service I'm offering on Tuesdays, office hours. You can book a call with me to talk about your questions about UX for XR, transitioning into the space, talk to me about your team, uh, how, ask your questions. You just come to me with your questions and we'll talk for the time allotted. And on today, Thursdays, we have this free class that you can show up and watch on Twitch and 
ask me questions as we play through the games, and I'll be thinking out loud as I play through the games, and this is how you can learn how I think and learn to apply that to your own analysis of games and how you learn to when you play games as well. And so today we are going to be playing Nobody Saves the World. But before that, I didn't have any questions or any follow-up from last week. Last week we did Cards and Tankers, which was a VR th game, a VR tabletop RPG. Um, another one of the textbooks, one of the books that I have referenced to your recommended reading list is The Gamer's Brain by Celia Hodent. And these pillars of gaming UX are from there. But before we talk about that, I thought that I might read a little bit more from her book today um, she has a section called see the master section is game user experience and I'm going to be reading from debunking UX misconceptions so I'll just start reading through one each week until we're done with them and then I might pick something else to read but Game user experience means using cognitive science knowledge and scientific method in game development. And there can be some resistance given that it's often a new approach. There's resistance given that it's often a new approach in many game studios. Not so long ago, there were no positions in the industry that had UX in the title. And now these UX invaders are spreading around. As is often the case, when a new process is introduced, it can generate apprehension and suspicion from veteran professionals, which is quite understandable. As a result, UX professionals, from interaction designers to user researchers, can be confronted with misconceptions about their discipline. When looking back at my own experience advocating for UX or cognitive psychology with development teams, there were five main misconceptions that required some debunking. These are described as below. Let me double check something here. Okay, sorry. I'm just going to read through one of these misconceptions. Misconception number one, UX will distort the design intents and make the game easier. This is a very common misconception that people have. There's often a strong fear among game developers that considering UX will remove all the challenge from the game and dumb it down. Funnily enough, during my training sessions about psychology and UX, members of the audience often ask me how games like Dark Souls, uh, which is made by From Software, will survive the UX invasion. Somehow, the UX practice is perceived as a steamroller that will smooth out and standardize all games. This misconception has always been the most surprising to me because the whole point of UX is precisely to help developers accomplish their vision, certainly not to distort the design intent. Therefore, if your target audience is hardcore gamers and the experience you want for them is suffering, so to speak, then UX practices will absolutely help you accomplish your sadistic goals. Rejoice. For example, consider the survival horror game Resident Evil by Capcom. And imagine a user researcher who observes the following during a playtest. At some point in the game, players open a closet where a zombie is hidden and now attacks them. Most players, being observed, are caught off guard and their first reflex is to try to move backward away from the zombie. But a table left by a level designer is blocking their retreat. As a result, many players panic as they struggle to move around the table. Most of them get hurt by the zombie and some even die. If UX was about making the game easier, then the user researcher could report to the development team that the tables should be removed because it causes player frustration. However, the whole intent of a horror game is to freak people out. So panic is actually a desirable emotion to elicit in that case. Therefore, this observation does not likely constitute a UX issue that needs fixing because it's probably aligned with the design intentions. In fact, this situation would probably be reported to the development team as a positive finding. Now, what can happen is that the development team may have different goals than the publishing or the executive team, and maybe your dream is to design the next Souls game, and I think she's referring to Dark Souls there, but the studio wants a more mainstream game that will appeal to a broad audience and with free-to-play 
mechanics. In that case, UX recommendations will account for the business goals as well as the design goals, so both must be aligned. When there is no alignment, the UX feedback can be frustrating to the game team because it may echo some business goals that they may not agree with. I can understand this frustration, but it should not be blamed on UX practices. Rather, it's a mismatch of priorities or a failed communication within the team and the studio as a whole. Good UX practitioners do not have any agenda of their own that they are trying to push, and they're actually not invaders trying to take over. We come in peace, and we're here to help. So that's that. Misconception number one, UX will distort the design intents and make the game easier. And I would add on to that, that a good UX practitioner, it comes with experience and learning. I mean, I'm not saying you're not a good UX practitioner if you don't do this, but as you learn and as you grow and develop your skills in your field, you'll learn this, hopefully, and if not, you, you're learning today. Um, there's this thing called stakeholder interviews that is a good thing that anyone can do at the beginning of a project. Um, and you don't necessarily have to be a UX designer or researcher to do this because in this case it's different from user research or usability testing um, because you have a set set of questions that pr pretty much you're going to ask any time you do this research. And those questions are going to get to the heart of what's what are the goals of the stakeholders so that you can get everyone on the same page? You would do them one on one with each stakeholder and then you bring them together to look at the results of all this research to see where are we not aligned? Where are we aligned? How do we get aligned? And so forth. Um, and that will help upfront keep this kind of problem from happening where you end up having that frustrating misalignment and mismatch of priorities in your, on your team and on your project. It's a good, good method that I recommend for anyone to use upfront, and I thank very much my friend Kate for, Kate Furman for teaching me that. So friends can teach friends. Um, now let's talk about the pillars of gaming UX, which she also has in this book. Um, this is what we use when we think about these things when we play any kind of video game here on this stream. I'm going to think about these pillars of gaming UX and the seven we've got two categories here from her book that she's set out here the first category is usability and those if you are from a UX background and you're uh, aware of Nielsen Norman heuristics these are basically Nielsen Norman heuristics the thing that she's done differently here is that um, those of you who come from a UX background or those of you who um, have experience working with people from a UX background, sometimes we like to use lots and lots of really big words that nobody else uses and that breaks down communication because you don't understand, you don't understand. Um, so what she's doing is she's translating the really big words and making it a lot more simple for anyone to understand regardless of your background on the team. Um, most of all, she is talking to the developers because they, the game developers have a certain um, vocabulary that they use. But by doing so, she has helped uh, remove some of those big words that UX practitioners really like to use. So again, the first category, you've got seven pillars here in this category of usability, pillars um, of the, under the usability. And those are signs and feedback. Let's see, yes, you can see my mouse. So signs and feedback, clarity, form follows function, consistency, minimum workload, error prevention and recovery, and flexibility. And really quickly going through those signs and feedback are the visual, the audio, the haptic cues that you use in your game um, to inform what's about to go happen, um, what's happening, what's about to happen. Um, that can also encourage players to execute specific action, like inviting signs, things, come click me, things like that. And, and they don't necessarily have to be signs saying click me, it can be some kind of design that you've done that says this, is, this means I need to interact with it. Um, and all features and possible interaction in a game should have signs and feedback associated with them. 
because they guide players throughout their experience. And clear feedback also give clear reaction to the system. So when you do click on something, there should be some kind of reaction. Like when I click on this, there is this reaction. I have it locked in place because I don't intend to use it in this example. But there is feedback here saying, oh, I can't move this right now because it's locked. But I can unlock it by long pressing to unlock. And if I long press to unlock, you saw that timed thing going on there. These are feedback. That's feedback. And so I do want to keep it locked because I don't want to mess with it. So now it's locked again. So it changed its state. That is a sign. That's feedback telling me that I've successfully done this thing. Whereas this one, it has a different kind of sign associated with it. It's got a different color, meaning that I can move it around if I want. Um, whereas that one is not locked. Okay. But that one is. Okay. Um, so that's what we mean by signs and feedback. And clarity is that all signs and feedback should be perceptible and clear. So you saw that I have here is what it looks like when it's locked and it's consistent. Um, consistency is a different topic. But all signs and feedback should be perceptible and clear to avoid player confusion. Typography, color contrast, font usage, UI design, um, all of these things work together to help avoid player confusion. And form follows function is the form of an item, the character, the icon, and so on should accurately convey its function. And you want to design for affordance. And so that means that it should intuitively inform how to interact with it. For, and affordance is, is from the um, Don Norman book, Sign of Everyday Things. It's on my bookshelf. Um, I recommend it if you haven't read it. Um, it is around the base, the design of physical things in our space. So a chair, what you're talking about affordance is, is a chair affords sitting because you look at it and you can see, oh, this is a chair. I can sit on it. It's telling you what you can do with it. And a doorknob affords turning. That's a doorknob. I can turn it or um, so forth. So that is what affordance is, is. You can look at something and you know intuitively what to do with it, what's going to happen when you do anything with it. Hopefully the chair's not going to break. Hopefully you would be able to tell if it was before you sat in it and so forth. Unless, of course, that's the goal of the game, um, then surprise. Um, and then consistency is what I was talking about earlier. The signs, the feedback, the controls, and the interface. Um, the menu navigation, world rules. There should be a consistency in these things. And not so much for consistency's sake, but it is to help with that clarity. All of these things work together to make it easier for the players to use. For example, I was talking about earlier this consistency. Anything that's locked on this specific page has this grayed out outline around it and it has this sim this sign down here saying that it's locked and I can unlock it by doing this. Um, this is also locked so there's a consistency whereas this is not locked and it has a thing, it has a toolbar that shows where I can do things and these notes that I can use to resize if I want. That is a consistent pattern for anything that is editable or manipulatable uh, versus, I don't know if that's a word, versus what's not. So that's what we mean by consistency. And you also want to make sure that you're taking into account players' expectations and mental models for certain types of things. For example, um, this was created for a certain type of people in mind. I know this isn't a game, but designers for sure know that when something looks like this, and it's a normal thing among different design apps, so we intuitively know this. Um, think about what in, in your games, what do NPCs look like versus enemies. Enemies generally have red health bars above their heads or a red name above their heads or something. There's some kind of consistency that's differentiating the different things. Um, and you're wanting to follow those expectations. Um, your for regional controls, things are different in different countries, different regions, and you want to take that into account as well. So there are different mental models. Um, and I talk about it a lot, but on the PlayStation, I have a Japanese 
PS Vita and I have the American PlayStation and the controls are different on the Japanese PS Vita. They still have the X, the O, and the triangle, and the square, the shapes. Um, however, the X and the O mean different things, uh, depending on if you're in America or in Japan. So that mental model shifts. Um, the, in America, the O is always back, whereas the X is always back in Japan. So these are mental models that you need to keep in mind when you're switching games from region to region and from and that's just one example i'm sure there's more um, you want to think about those things um, and th follow that consistency across region if you're doing a glo global game or a game for another region um, or so forth and then minimum workload is um, your cognitive load and your physical load your cognitive load is how much memory and attention and mental function you need to play the game versus physical load is how much physical movement or action do you need to do this thing how much how far across the screen do you need to move the mouse to do different things and so forth that is physical load and those things must be taken into account and minimized for tests that are not a part of the game experience you again we don't want to dumb down a game and if it's a part of the mechanics, then you treat it differently. Um, for example, you, you don't want it to be cumbersome or overly complicated unless it's a game mechanic. And I like to use the example of the confuse uh, condition in a video game. If you're in a boss fight and the boss casts confuse on you and you're trying to move around, if you're using a controller, for example, with the joystick to move around and the joystick should normally, if you're not under this confused condition, you should move around how you expect. You move the joystick forward, you move forward, and so forth. But on if you've got this confused condition on you, the joystick does not behave as you would expect. And so then you're going to go in some random opposite direction of where you're trying to go when you move your joystick to move around because the confused condition is on you. So that is your you don't want to, yeah, if that's part of the challenge, then fine. Uh, but other than that, you want the UI to not get in the way of the game, is what we're saying. The interactions and the UI should not get in the way. They should enable you to perform the things that you need to perform without getting in the way. And players should be able to focus on the game mechanics or the features and the content and not have to worry about how to do things with the UI. And then error prevention and recovery is around anticipating what the errors the players could make and then prevent them from happening, of course, unless it's a game mechanic, again, um, for tasks that are not core to the experience. Um, uh, for example, I like using the save example is if you're trying to exit out and they're about to lose their game, play for the last two hours you want to pop up a thing saying hey do you want to save your game you're about to lose your stuff give them an option to fix that give them an option to save give them an option to cancel out and continue because maybe they accidentally hit something to quit and they didn't mean to let them let them undo or correct their behavior um, whenever that's applicable um, and then flexibility is around the more customizable the game is, for example, in terms of control mapping, font size, colors, is going to give more people access to your game. Think about accessibility and inclusive design when you're thinking about people with low vision, people with low hearing, people with motor, motor function impairments. If you want them to be able to play your game, because that is a very large audience of people who love games as much as everyone else <coughs> who does not have these impairments, you want them to be able to play your game because they are a very large number of people and they want to live like everyone else. So give them the ability to do so and the more accessible it is for everyone, the better it is for everyone. And that includes language, audio, difficulty levels. For example, some people like to play, like she was saying earlier in that misconception, we were talking about earlier, do or die. Some people want to play do or die. 
let them do so, but then some people just want to enjoy the story and play a casual game because they're trying to chill after a long day of work. Let them do so. Um, if within, within reason, of course, you know, depending on the game, what's the purpose of your game, but are there different difficulty levels that you can add? And that's going to give uh, more access to people. And then on, she added this new category called engageability, which is specific for games. Um, and it has three pillars, which are motivation, emotion, and game flow. And motivation is around the competence and the autonomy, relatedness, meaning. And um, so you want to aim to satisfy the player's need for competence. You want to satisfy their need for autonomy and their motivation. How, how, what is making them want to play this game? What are your rewards that you're giving them? Offer them re meaningful rewards within context of when they would need them. For example, if you're brand new to the game and you're still low level, you're going to die a lot easier. You're going to take damage a lot easier. So in that case, they may be a lot more interested in healing potions and armor than they would be interested in crafting materials. Because unless you're going to let them craft their own armor or healing potions immediately, which usually doesn't happen. So give them what they need. That's going to give them more motivation to continue. Money to buy armor. Healing potions is more desirable than a bunch of junk sitting in their inventory taking up space that they can't even use. They're just going to end up selling it anyway. Unless, of course, the point is to teach them to buy and sell stuff, then go for it. Um, depends on what's the purpose of your game. An emotion, polish the game feel. Um, that is, um, it's that whole polish. How does that game all fit together? And we'll see that this this game is really polished that we're going to play today. Um, they really put a lot of thought into that. Um, control, camera, character are the three C's of this game polish and game feel. And you're wanting to enable this um, physical reality, this presence, this discovery, surprises, things like that. And then the game flow is the pacing, the level of challenge, how long does it take them to learn, what's that difficulty curve, how hard does it get the further you play the game, there's going to be some kind of curve, or it will get boring. Um, and you distribute learning by doing instead of just throwing everything at them at once in the front and the expecting them to remember everything you want to teach them as you go and this is what we're going to be trying to think about as we go through this game today so and then afterwards we will do a rose thorn bud exercise so let's talk about the game that we're playing today and that is nobody saves the world this game just came out not too long ago january 18th it's been very positive so far. Positive reception so far. And this is a bit of a different game. Um, when the ancient calamity reawakens, who can save the world? Nobody. That's you. You're nobody. Master the art of transformation to become a slug, ghost, dragon, and more in this new take on action RPGs from the creators of Guacamelee. Complete quest to discover and swap between 15 plus and varied and distinct forms. Mix and match abilities in unexpected ways to unlock and complete even more challenging quests and explore a vast overworld on your own or with a friend online while clearing shape-shifting dungeons in an effort to stop the calamity and save the world. So this game, one of the big different things about this game is that you can change your form to complete different mechanics which is interesting and then you have to think about which mechanic which form that you need to do for what it's going to help you with what um, and you can also as you level up you can start mixing and matching those abilities amongst the different ones um, and you have various unconventional quests evolving dungeons it feels it's a different feel of a game than what I'm used to playing um, I can't say that I, th I can say that there are a lot of people out there who have played a lot more games than I have. I'm working on it, uh, as you can see. Um, the music is good. It is uh, the artwork is great. 
it is very interesting and intriguing game. So that is what we're going to be playing today. So let's get started. With Nobody Saves the World. So one thing, hold on just a second, sorry. One thing before we do get started is that I want to talk about controls. Right now, I'm just using my keyboard arrows. I think when I can, I'm trying to remember because I have played this game um, before, um, whether or not a pop-up came up and said this game is better on with a controller. So you can play it with a keyboard, but it's much better with a controller. I think I remember seeing a pop-up about that. Um, that's a good thing. Um, that they've let you know that because I did try playing it with a keyboard at first and as you got more skills and needed to do more things in the game it became much more complicated to play it on the keyboard because I have small hands and I only have two hands and so it was getting much harder to handle all the buttons with the small hands not being able to reach everything on the keyboard to do what needed to be done with the keyboard to play the game. So, um, it is recommended to play it with controllers, and I think that should be more apparent um, up front. Um, I'm going to write that down. Um, make controllers, the need for controllers more apparent. But there's one thing that I did want to talk about regarding the choice of controllers is that when I, let's see, is it here? Controls, nope, wait, input mode, controller. Okay, so if, it just became really complicated and too much for my little hands to deal with as I tried to play more stuff. Um, but I still do use the keyboard sometimes. You can use both but I use the controller for the actual gameplay. Um, and I'm just hitting escape to go back, but okay, so it's under options. Okay, this is what I was wanna talk about. Um, these are the kinds of things you wanna allow the flexibility of customization and so forth that you wanna change. People with audio impairments may th have trouble distinguishing voice from music if the music's too loud so you want to allow them to be able to adjust the volume of different things i don't i'm not sure if there is actually voice in here i don't remember but um you want to, them to be able to adjust the volume of these things so that they they can more easily distinguish what they need to hear and this goes for many people i am apparently very sensitive to sound so music that I usually have to turn the music way down um, because it's just too loud. Um, and I don't have a hearing impairment that I'm aware of, but it's just too much sound. It's just too loud. Um, I don't like loud. Um, so there's these different things, even if you don't have impairments, you're still going to have your own little preferences and quirks and so forth. Language, allow them to this is what I was talking about, allow them to be able to choose their languages. And yes, we want haptics, or no, we don't. Beak. Um, <laughs> that was activating the haptics. So this is what I was really wanting to talk about, the controller visuals, because this part's not clear. What it's doing is letting you choose between your type of controller. And it's not clear. This was the main problem that I had. Um, and it's just saying type one, type two, and type three. I don't know what type one, type two, and type three means. What does this mean? why not just say or include a photo of what you're talking about so that we can see what they're actually letting you choose between is your playstation and your sony and i think nintendo i'm not sure controllers they're letting you choose and through trial and error i found out that type 3 is the sony controller um, you want them to be able to play with the controller that they're using for the sake of, like I said in here in controls, you'll see 
that the controls are actually mapped to the correct controller. This is the Sony controller. So why not just say in this section under options, Sony or show a picture, one or the other, instead of just type one, type two, type three. Do people really know what that means? I didn't know what that means. So I'm assuming other people don't know what that means. So make that clear. And that saved a lot of trouble because for a while I was trying to mentally translate because I didn't know what this even meant. Controller visuals. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't realize it was saying switch between your controller types until I don't even know how I figured that out. It was through trial and error or something. So I spent a while trying to just translate the controller buttons into the Sony from the uh, Xbox, which I wasn't familiar with because I don't have an Xbox. I don't play Xbox games. So that is an important thing to keep in mind when you want to make your settings clear and you want to help people as much as you can without assuming that they know what you mean. Show what you mean. Okay, let's start. We're going to start a new game, a new adventure in normal mode. So is there an option for different modes? Let's see. I don't see options for different modes. I wonder if that's, oh, unless it's co-op. Co-op versus normal. Okay, maybe. Because you can play with your friends. We're going to start a new game though. And I was using my keyboard again, because I haven't really got into gameplay yet. And let me switch my camera so you can actually see the game instead of me. You wake up in a small shack. You can't remember how you got here. And I'm switching to my controller. Use L to move. That's the left trigger. <laughs> a visitor, where are your pants? Oh, you have amnesia? That doesn't explain the lack of pants, but I'm great, forgetful myself. I'm sure Nostromagus can help with the potion or something. I'm using the X button on the controller to progress through. And you can see that Nostromagus is in a different color. So that means that that's some kind of interest, uh, important element of the game. This is a design pattern that people use in their game development to tell you what you what is important to you that you need to remember. Nostromagus is something to remember. Um, and this is also another common pattern. You see that blinking arrow at the at the side of this dialog box letting this is allowing me to progress at my own pace so that I have time to read and process what I'm hearing or reading um, different people process information at different paces different speeds and you want it's important to allow them to be able to do that at their own pace instead of auto progressing them through you can give them the option to do that I have seen games where while this dialog box is up there will be some kind of little tool tip in a corner or something saying if you'd like to do auto progress or something um, press this button to activate auto progress or deactivate it um, so that people have that option but I prefer to keep that on so that I can go at my own pace now, where does he live again? Oh, right, behind me, the mansion with his name on it. Okay. So, and the, let's look at the UI real quick. I've got a map and I can hit L2. That is the trigger, left trigger to open the map. And it's telling me which buttons to use to progress through the map. I've got me, that's nobody, and I am an F grade. That's not great. 
um, and my abilities, I'm using my joystick to, left joystick to move through these things. Um, all I have right now is a sad little slappy poo that restores five, plus five mana on hit. That's all I've got right now. Nothing else. And I have no money. None of those other things. Just a slap. The artwork is so they have a pattern here, a design pattern that is. I don't even remember how I figured this out. Um, maybe it was in the tutorial later, but this is how you get drops. They have a design pattern, so these plants in this area that are shaped like this give you they're moving, they're swaying, whereas these plants are all still. So there's a distinct design pattern here that makes these, tells you that these are different. I think I was probably taught it later in the tutorial. Maybe. So let's go on. And here's Nostromagus' home. Nostromagus, he is gone. I like here on the dialogue as well that not, so a lot of the patterns are that the person that's talking is shown, but the person they're talking to isn't always shown. But here, you've got both of them here, so you can see that, that there's this conversation. And you can also see that um, there are expressions going on as they're talking. Who did this? Master, I will avenge you. And you can see his expression has changed now. That's something you don't always see in the games because they're as in the middle of the screen. You can see them there. That's usually where you see your character and you only see the speaking character that close up and you can't see what your character's doing because they're too far out. But here you can see both and you can see that he's not reacting very well to Randy the Rad. Who the hell are you? You must be a new trainee. Where are your pants? Show some respect. Nostromagus, the most powerful wizard of all time, has been kidnapped. He must have left a clue for me. Randy the Rat is his intrepid protege. I'm basically a master wizard. Nostromagus has delayed my graduation from the protege program for the fifth time, but he knows I'm ready. Fifth time. I need to think... Make me a coffee. Caramel macchiato venti, extra shot, half skim milk, half mountain goat milk, 2% foam, and pronto. Press the X. Okay, here. Here it's teaching you. Press the X while near objects to interact. Randy, I'm in trouble. Take the wand. Find me. In. I wanted that coffee yesterday, Slowpoke. Wait. What were you doing over there? Is this a crime scene? This is a crime scene. You weren't messing with anything, were you? Tell Randy about the wand. No. Hell no, he's a jerk. You're not a trainee. You're officially a suspect. Randy, monsters have invaded the Grand Castle. It's covered in a strange fungus. I'll deal with you later. Could you move a bit to the right? Perfect. I really like the artwork, the art style in this game. It's very fun. You now have quests. Hold L1 to open the quest scroll. Try completing your quests. 
Examine your surroundings, smash stuff, walk around the cell. Weak slap. Slappy poo. Sad, sad, slappy poo. A broken toilet. That didn't stop someone from using it, though. Hold L1 to open the quest scroll. Try completing your quests. Now I need to escape from the basement, examine my surroundings, walk around the cell. The crystal seems to be saving my progress. I appreciate that it's teaching us how to save. And there's a little save icon that shows up in the bottom left corner whenever you get close to it. At first I thought you had to keep clicking on it, but then it finally made me realize, oh, I just need to be within proximity. This is a star door. You need eight stars to open this door. Contemplating my existence. So I have two star things. Okay, what else was I doing? Examine my surroundings. A bed. It's wet, hopefully from the leak in the ceiling. Good job. Press. Is that. No, that's not it. See, this is the part that's not clear. Is that symbol looks like the trackpad symbol on the controller, the trackpad that's in the middle here for the Sony. And that's making me think that's what I need to click right now, which is not the case because when I click that, it brings up my master menu. So they've got the wrong symbol here. Um, so I have to try to remember which symbol I need to press. And it's not letting me do it. Why isn't it letting me do it? I, c I didn't know how to do it. It wasn't working. So I ended up having to press tab on the keyboard because I knew from a previous tutorial that that's um, how another way to open it. But I wouldn't have been able to do it otherwise at all. And I don't know why. Uh, I'm trying to write it down real quick. So that I can remember. Um, so ideally when you're observing someone or you're playing a game like this, you would make notes as you're playing. Um, I haven't been doing that on the stream because it takes a while, but I can go ahead and start doing that because you want to know how to do this anyway. So you take notes as you go. So we have unlocked this new form. Go to town with your little chompers. Restores plus 5 mana and builds plus 15 poison on hit. Health items also restore plus 8 mana.
Redeeming quests is the best way to get stars, XP, and form points. You must earn three stars by redeeming. You just earn three stars by redeeming your quests. You also earned enough FP form points to unlock the rat form. And they're showing the wrong one again. And again, that's not the right one. And it's not working. And I don't know why it's not working in here. So I'm going to have to press tab again because it's not working. I wonder if that's a bug. It's a possible bug. that's definitely something you want to take note of when you're playing games evaluating games for your own your own designs and so forth make note of that I'm gonna have to press tab again it's the only way I can do it and I'm just using the left joystick but I can also use the d-pad which is this on the controller Switch to rat form. And I have to get to, I'm currently F. I have to get to D to unlock that and B to unlock that, whatever that is. And I have a new quest. They're all baddies. Alrighty. I am also an OCD saver. now it works so it's probably a bug in that area clear the bu dungeon because it's working now and it's not the it's not the um this button it's the left second trigger the left trigger button um to open up the big menu l2 So it's probably a bug in there. This is quick. Okay, yeah. So on the map it says L2 uh, in the left. That's how you open the map and that's how you open the whole menu. I like the little rat. I just need one star. Let's see. Oops. Can I get a photo? There. Oops, almost. Close. Close enough. Their transitions are interesting. And they've changed their lighting and their overall color scheme here. You've got this green goo. And flies everywhere. Those There were flies already, but... Saying there's quite some rot going on in the world right now. And it did take me a while to figure out that food gives you HP. And that thing that popped up in the middle of the fight freaked me out the first time it ever happened. Because I was in the middle of the fight and it was blocking my view and that obtrusiveness upset me um, so I'm to level D now that's nice um, it stressed me out quite a bit 
until I realized that it was if I level up my HP goes back to full and my mana goes back to full which is a benefit so I want to accept those quests as soon as possible to get that level up because that's going to make me more powerful in the dungeon but I didn't know that at first so it just caused a lot of confusion and frustration at first because I'm what's this thing popping up in the corner it's distracting me when I'm trying to stay alive right now so I don't know what better way they could have done that um, that would be something to think about um, I have a new skill now um, and it 30% of consumed damage is leached as health and it costs 30 mana and there's a cooldown on it cooldown is a mental model that they're following so people understand what cooldown means if they play a lot of video games they'll understand cooldown means that you can only use it um, it's a limitation because it's a better power that you can only use it a certain number of times or within or certain durations until you can use it again um, to keep you from just being completely OP on stuff. This is way easier to play with a controller than trying to do this with the keyboard because I tried it was so hard again because my hands are small and I'm just so much more used to a controller but this is also optimized for controls controller and I really like this little rat because it's doing a lot of damage and it moves around very quickly So I can't go this way until I use this lever. And I like their level designs too. It's just, if you look at it, it's just very simple, very, very simple shapes for your maps in your dungeons. But then once we get back out to the world, I'll show you the world maps. They're really cool designs. The map design. Okay. This popped up right in the middle of me doing something if I were in the middle of fighting right now I would be really really annoyed right now I'm not in the middle of fighting um, so think about when you would do a, something like this because I can't do anything I can't move as I'm trying to use my joystick I can't move I can't do anything until I acknowledge this tip that they're showing right now yes it's a valuable tip and so it works okay in this situation the, um, so Nat's Rat's Gnaw builds poison status. To apply poison, gnaw an enemy until their circular poison status meter becomes solid. Status effects are only applied once they're fully built up. Try using poison to complete your quests. Okay. But there is something here that is annoying. Because I was... Because if I died at a fight, like the one up here. I'm probably, it's probably about to happen. But, um, well, it didn't happen. So if I died and I came back through this part, which did happen earlier when I was playing, it would redo that tip right here every time I came this way. Even after, <laughs> even after I'd already seen it. And that was very frustrating because, yeah, I've already seen this. Stop showing me this tip. But I think it stops showing you once you've cleared the dungeon, maybe. But if they've seen the tip once, don't keep re-showing it. It's just annoying. Um, you have unredeemed quests. And they're using that wrong button symbol again because I have a different controller and I don't know what that button means on a different one. 
but it's not the right button for this controller. Okay, so it's just telling me I need to redeem my quest because that's gonna help me. Um, it's the best way to get XP in forums and right now it's in my best interest to do so. This is probably gonna, possibly gonna help me. Nope, I'm not leveling up yet. So I don't have more health yet, but. little rat much better than the weak slappy poo and this one that's over my head I totally didn't understand that at first what that meant um, I understand it I only understood it later once I saw somebody I need health yeah, I died. Um, but I'm glad it starts you here instead of back at the beginning of the whole dungeon. So there are some reset points. So if you die, you don't have to redo the whole dungeon, which would be incredibly frustrating, especially on your first dungeon. So this is a lot more forgiving, but I still have to redo this area. At least I don't have to redo the entire dungeon again. But I do have my health back, which is nice. So, chicken. And I want that XP. New form unlocked. This this artwork is really fun. It actually reminds me a lot of, and it's not because it looks identical, but it reminds me a lot of Persona 5, which is one of the first games I played after getting back into gaming after a long time of not gaming. And I just love that game a lot. And this artwork, these cutscenes where you power up or you do some kind of success, it's that kind of feel on that unlock screen, um, which is really, it bring, brings back nostalgia to me for that, but it, which is, um, it's probably, I don't know if that's an, a lot of people are going to get that unless you've played a game like Persona 5, but anyway, I've got this new one that I'm probably going to need to try. It's 20% of your attack damage is dealt as an extra sharp attack while below 30% max health. And I unlocked Ranger. Hold X to add damage, range, and piercing. Oh, okay, right, right. Hold down the X button. Restores plus four mana on hit. I generally don't like ranged fighters because they die so quickly. I like OP fighters. And that rat right now is OP. I have six stars, I need eight. Switch forms in the middle of a fight, which is cool. And and notice their facial expressions change when you choose them or don't choose them. Smile, 
beautiful, happy, sad. Me? Nope. <laughs> it's fun the amount of detail they've gone into they've put into this. And these are all the different forms that you can unlock. I can't see what comes next yet, but I have to get her to a B before I can get the bodybuilder, and I have to get her to a C before I can get the slug. And same here with horse and magician. And I have to get to B before I can unlock the egg. It's a pretty fun, fun concept they have here. Health, I need health. Yes, I need health. this rat. Teleportation rod. Boss fight. Oh, the one over my head. I keep not talking about it. That's for co op. Pretty sure I'm about to die. Hold on. Let's see if guard does better. Probably not. Nope. Not better. About to die. Yep. Died. Okay. Taking that the XP, but I need you to drop is food. These these ones do a lot of damage. see myself which is really frustrating right now that I cannot see myself so I don't know where I am so I don't know that I'm in the middle of these because I'm so small um, can't see myself so let me try going bigger I kind of wish that one would stay above my head so I could see myself and all the mob. I, my eyesight's not that great. So, I have an issue seeing to begin with. I have enough stars.
Wait, what was that? Oh, oh, maybe it was telling me I have enough stars to get out? I don't know what that pop-up was, because I was in the middle of fighting. Right. I'm kind of stuck right now. Level me up so I go back to full health. Thank you. Knock opponents away with your stylish booties. And that leveled up to two. And this little exclamation point seems that means there's something new, so that's a design pattern. And there's also a design pattern in quests, because I have quests that are specific to the rat and specific to this night dude and the ranger, which I haven't touched yet. Because, like I said, I don't like rangers, the ranged ones, ranged fighters, because they die too easy. Um, but I'll have to try at some point if I want to level up the and get the slug and the bodybuilder. Yay, booties. Oh, and I finished the quest. I got these up things. I found some upgrade tokens. Press, and it's still showing the wrong button. St still showing the wrong symbol. Press that button, which is to me L2, and enter the upgrades menu to power up your abilities. And again, I can't do it. I'm trying. I can't. So I'm going to have to hit the tab again. So it's in the it's in the final boss dungeon and in the little it's a final boss so you want to take note of where it's happening final boss dungeon and then that little uh, that first little get area with the, at the trap door with the bed um, and save that area. I forgot what that area was called, but I can at least describe it. Um, and then the final boss area is where this issue is happening. I'm going to press the tab. Um, and so I would also make a note. This is with the Sony controller. I don't have another controller to try it with another controller. But even though w it's not our responsibility as a UX designer to do QA testing and bug testing is necessarily if we come across one to tell tell people it's, even if it's not our job it's just helping the team um, so power up okay now I can do it I don't know why I couldn't before so what I don't know what happened why so I press the tab, and I went through the menu. I forgot about the power-up thing, because I was talking about the bug. But then now, and I also notice when I do it this time, the L2 is not showing on the map when I couldn't do it earlier. And I'm recording this, so I could actually go back and get the clip and um, talk about it. I'll go ahead and clip that on Twitch. Um, and so that, yeah, that's a potential bug um, because the L2 wasn't showing. And now it is again, and now I can use it again. So I don't know what the deal is with that. I don't know why that's happening. And also just notice that little symbol above, and I can't use my mouse on here because the mouse doesn't show, so I can't, I have to just describe it to you. You see up in the top left, underneath the health bar, there's that little symbol of, with the little sword, the green um, POW symbol with the sword. 
um, I don't know what that means, but I'm just now noticing. I think it might be a buff. Um, it's a passive. Okay, so is that the passive action? Yes. So I guess that passive ability is active? What's his health on? Nope. So I don't know. So let's do the power up so I can power up stuff. Do I want to power up the passive? I'd like to power up the passive. I want to power up everything. I'm gonna power up the boot stomp. can go back. Yeah, the transitions between scenes are fun. How they have you walking through a path. And... And now I can't get back unless I change back to the rat. So this is where you have to know what skill to use when. That's easy right now it will get a little bit more challenging and but not horribly um in the future i haven't i don't want to use her okay Sock on the dryer. So, there's only certain things that you can, there seems to be a slight difference in brightness of the things that you can shoot or put damage. Maybe, maybe not. Okay, but there's nothing else to look at in here. But I want stuff, so I'm gonna go around and hit stuff. don't like how it pans out on me when I get to this part because I'm trying to focus on my ranger and go this way but you're auto panning me out Ugh. did you hear the odd noises during the storm last night so strange I accidentally clicked that when I was trying to shoot the boxes she's in the way but yes yeah, strange noises Still no pants, eh? It's okay, you do you. That part's a little weird because she has clothes on, so. That. So, let's see. <laughs> Jailbreak. Search for clues. Head out of town, figure out what's going on. Oh yeah, the world map. So the world map's hand-drawn. I love the world map. It's pretty fun. Um, you don't have to, and this is just an example, of you don't have to actually do high fidelity, gorgeous artwork to have a fun game that's interesting. And now that said, their artwork here 
this took a lot of time to do the detail here took a lot of time to do I can appreciate that I have a degree in graphic design so I can appreciate how much effort you can put into artwork to give it a certain look and feel and the detail that goes into it to make it look crisp and so forth but they have it in a fun forgiving design here um, so you don't have to lots of people want to become great wizards like with Nostrum Mages you have to train very hard very very hard not for me and I don't know what's up with these peacocks but I can't talk to them and I didn't want to shoot it I just wanted to talk to it <laughs> and I can't go in the water to talk to that crocodile or whatever We are waiting for a ranger tasked with delivering a message for us. I guess you must be that ranger. Can you pass an important message to Randy? These people are really good guards. They're just assuming all kinds of things about people. So I need to pass an important message on to Randy the rat. He left in a hurry not too long ago to investigate the monster invasion at the Grand Castle north of here. Here's the message. We are out of mountain goat milk for your coffee. Can we use regular goat milk instead? Master Sergeant Guard. I would absolutely hate to have to report to someone like Randy the Red. <laughs> okay. Oh, maybe it's just saying this, uh, this is my act of passive ability? So it's just telling me what my passive ability is right now. Okay, that's what that means. I was looking back at that health bar right below it, the little ability symbol. It's telling me which passive ability is active right now. Oh, so hold R2 to lock your direction. Oh. Okay, this was a problem that I was having when I was trying to play earlier. And I wished that it had um, told me again because it only showed it like once or twice and then I couldn't remember and so that goes back to your memory cues and tooltips um, is it just showed me once right here to lock my direction so this is how I lock my direction and at the time I was playing trying to play on the keyboard and it was telling me to use a key that um, I think was too big for my hand or I didn't understand or something at the time. I don't know. And then I changed to controller and the tip never showed again. So if it's smart enough, if it were smart enough to know, hey, she switched to a different controller. Now let's start showing her some how to use the new controller because she didn't go through that. That would be useful. I, you know, that's a possibly a big ask on a game development and how often do people change their controllers in the middle of a game probably not often so you have to weigh the like what is the value of this versus that makes a huge difference wow because i was trying to fight and i would run and then i'd end up shooting the wrong way because i didn't realize how to lock so that makes a huge difference. That makes a huge difference. This pink Alino dude is awesome looking. Now your normal fairy. Hey there, buddy. I've got some good stuff for you. <laughs> Here you go. Your mana just went up by a little. There's lots of other fairies like me scattered around the world. Try to find us all. Quest discovered mana fairies. Find five. Okay. I 
hit the wrong one. Ah! I'm trying to hit R2 and I'm hitting L2. Let me get my bearings straight here. She's still weak. Dog, I'm flummoxed by the readings on this fluxometer. This is very bad. If Calamity gets strong enough, it's going to infect everything. It'll be the end. So if you listen, you'll hear that they are making some uh, sound effects, uh, but they're not talking. This is actually a good option for voiceover to save money. Uh, and production costs because one of the problems that you might come across quite often when you're doing game design is that the um, sorry I'm trying to get my mouse out of the way um, is that the whenever you make a change to the dialogue it, you, something in the dialogue has to change a quest changes or something and you have to go back and change the dialogue. If you've already recorded your voiceover work, voiceover work is expensive when you do word by word voiceover. So one of the ways that games get around that is by still having voiceover, but they're just doing enough sound to imply an emotion, a tone, and then they're not actually saying anything. Um, you, if you pay attention to games, this is a common behavior that they use as a way of saving money. So if you're doing a game and you want voiceover, but you want to save money on production, this is an option. And, so, and some people do it differently. So when you're in your cutscenes, which is your higher production work anyway, those, they're more cinematic. They'll often have more voiceover. It'll be that actually what they're saying is what you're seeing on screen. They're saying the whole dialogue. Whereas in your out in the world, you're doing the quests like this, it changes to this type where it's a tone. Um, and that's just a good way of saving money and balancing that cost versus um, future potential changes. So it's, it's a good practice that you wanna keep in mind if you're doing your own games. This is very bad. If the Calamity gets strong enough, it's going to infect everything. It'll be the end. Oh my, how long have you been standing there? I'm Octavia, the witch. This is my mummy. This is the mummy. Sorry. Sorry to be possessive there. Mm hmm. We're doing field research. And you? Oh, my fluximeter is picking up Calamity traces on you. Are you a fighter, or what are you? Wait, don't tell me you're that dweeb. Yeah, Randy. Are you with Randy? A thousand times, no. Okay, great, that guy's the worst. My data shows the monsters are protecting the gem shards. The gem is was used to banish the Calamity in ancient times. If the Calamity is back, Nostromagus and the wizards of the world are going to need those shards. Maybe you can help. There's one shard inside the Grand Castle for sure. We don't know what level we need to be, but you need five, 15 stars to get there and it's a normal dungeon. I only have three stars. So that means I need to play and do some quests. Me? No way I'm getting them. It's too dangerous. So, are you up to it? 
and I'm still low on health. I have a new quest. So I found a clue. switch to rat so I can hopefully consume stuff and heal drop some but drop some food Transition to a new map. Yep. Oh, there's a treasure over there. I would like that treasure. Wait. <laughs> Just a minute. There's a save right here. I'm gonna do that first. Thanks. I've seen you around with those full pockets, my friend. You're quite an interesting being. Yes, a bit of an oddity you are. I'm sure, a rich oddity, I'm sure we can find a resting place for all that gold. Call me shopkeeper, but if you buy enough things, you can call me honey bunny. <laughs> Infinite quest. I can buy stars. Do I want to buy stars? 500 per star. Just earned one for free. Oh, I didn't want to talk to her. You're not from here, are you? You should definitely check out the horse mines to the northeast. They have horses, and it's a mine. Thank you. Ah, I don't. We have the Tower of Atonement to the west, but I wouldn't recommend it. Unless you like to atone for something. So, the placement of this is just annoying. Because I'm trying to get this flower. Fine. I just held down the X button. Because every time I got near it to try to do that, I talked to her instead. But I just started over here, held down the X, and went backwards. That way I didn't have to deal with it. I want that. So there seems to be something new at the shop. Okay. I guess because I have enough gold now. I can up my stats. Guess I want that. There was a circle indicator saying to hold down the button. I want that treasure.
treasure usually has food in it. So, well, it's a big chance, but that helps me heal. Okay. Need to go to, wanna explore the town. There's a sign on the door. Knight's Guild is out hunting dragons. Leave a message by carving it into the door or come back later. And there's a thing here, but let's see if I can get to it. Nope. Can't get to it. So something's going to happen in the future that lets me get to it. I can't get to it right now. Now there's bunnies everywhere. <laughs> Odd looking subject of mine. Hideous monsters have overtaken my home. What is a king without a castle? Nothing but a finely dressed loiterer. Won't you help me? It's an order anyways. I assume you know the star doors work. How star doors work, sort of. Well, neither do I. But Randy told me that stars can be earned by exploring dungeons and completing quests. I'll mark the nearest dungeons on your map now. Tower of Atonement. Horse Mines. Adventure awaits. Go on, my dear subject. Show those monsters the royal greeting. A kick to the skull. But I need 15, and I don't have 15, so I have to go explore the world and finish quests. So I've got one more quest on the rat that I will go do, which requires knitting things up. Wait, which one is it? Chomp or consume? Okay, consume. Tower of Atonement. Don't have any money right now. What level is this dungeon? One. Okay. That's a nice treasure. I'm back to full health. So, what time is it? Explore the map first.
little bad as you can see. I died. Ah, oh, just when I beat it, too. Oh, that's annoying. one power up oh there's something else here oh <laughs> pixie hey there I have a free mana upgrade the music's fun too um, I like the mood the music's playing Pay attention, there's different mood lighting in each little dungeon area. There's a wild-eyed horse here. Seeing you, it bolts into the mines. get there from over there. I'm guarding the eastern gate, none shall pass. You want through? Yeah, right. Don't make me laugh. Do I look like a western gate guard to you? stars I just leveled up 
So let's try another dungeon. This is why the game's really easy and it's compelling to continue it. This one, I still don't have enough stars for this one, but I can go do the other one. Let's see, do I have any more stars on rat? Uh, quests on rat, nope. But I do on these two. Gah. I just don't like ranged attackers. They're not strong at all. Can I buy anything to help me out here? Defense. I want some defense. Yeah, scene transitions are fun. I'm already being attacked? Was that an attack? Oh, no. It changed again. Ever since the Calamity showed up, these dungeons keep changing whenever I leave. Uh, I'm never gonna make it to the end if the walls keep shifting. He's gonna die. Ah! Okay. Did that give me another star? Yeah, I died. She dies way too fast and way too easy. And this is a level one dungeon and we're level three. And it's already changed. R does help as long as I remember which trigger button is the one to hold down. Then it's actually much better holding it down than not. As long as I can remember which trigger. Because my brain wants to do the left trigger for whatever reason. Because see, like what I'm doing here is just changing directions. That's annoying. But holding down the trigger makes it way easier. But I have to stop and think about it. At which trigger am I supposed to be using right now?
to consciously stop and think which trigger do I hold down and think about it before I go into a fight or so it starts to get a little bit more complicated that way and if I can keep them in there those things will help me yay okay so in this game it's nice that the enemies also get hit by the AoE stuff, not just you. It's like friendly fire versus... Friendly fire is a thing, which is makes it easier if it's the enemy getting the friendly fire. Okay, I need to check the whole floor before I have to... Is that the whole floor? No. this part of it? Nope. Okay, maybe that was the whole floor. Or was it? Nope, that's the whole floor. Good. Uh-oh. Already? Where's the enemies? And again, when I first played this game, that whole pop-up thing, new um, quest completion upset me because it was interfering in, in the middle of the fight, which in other games I'm not used to stopping in the middle of the fight to do something, like complete a quest. I usually do that after I'm done fighting, but in this case it's different, because in this case you actually get the benefit if you do stop and finish the quest. Which changes the way you're thinking about a game. It's, it's not a mental model that I'm used to, at least. Um, I'm not saying it's terrible, but it took me time to figure it out. Um, saying oh yeah I really do need to stop and take this quest and figuring out remembering which button does what so that I can quickly do that um, it's more difficult the newer you are to playing the game and um, so it's something to think about again we're not our target audience so if it's easy for you it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be easy for everyone uh, but again what's the mechanic of the game what's the benefit versus the um, doing it versus not doing it um, but again it benefits me because I just powered up and I got a new skill now and I'm that's probably gonna restore my mana um, and health as well which is beneficial to surviving an attack especially in a dungeon that resets every time you have to die and come back So I don't want to have to do that. I probably will again because Ugh. No, give me food. Ah, and I'm having to think about which way to lock. Thank you. Constantly changing directions whenever you're Where's that enemy coming from? Ugh, changing that part's the annoying part. some enemies there. The 
back and keeping them in the line of that helps me. Ah, that doesn't help me. <laughs> Just stand right in the middle of it. This one I need to go down. And um, also, while we're going through this dungeon, again, if you are watching this later on demand, don't think that you can't participate. Go ahead and you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, that was an accident, or you can um, just add a comment on YouTube later, a question, comment, um, what did I miss, if I missed something, some kind of design question around this, and, we'll, and we will at the end when we do our Rose Thorn Bud exercise, we are going to talk about how would this translate, the, what we're learning here translate into XR. I don't see any enemies yet. What's that about? There were no enemies on this floor? I already killed them? What happened? Did I accidentally go up? Huh? That's weird. Uh, I'm not... Complaining. Hmm. But that is weird. They're all dead already. How did I... Oh, this is home. How did I get here? I thought I went down. I don't know how I got lost. I guess while I was talking. I accidentally went the wrong way, I guess. the stairs are weird I think that's what happened it's like I thought the other stairway okay I'm back at the entrance again I'm back at the entrance Back at the entrance again. What am I missing here? Okay. Now it's saying go down. So if I do this, I'm back at the entrance. So I'm going to do opposite of what it says. And I'm probably going to die before I finish this because we're going to do the opposite of what it says. is weird. Okay, now we're in a new area. That was weird. So the signs on the stairs are opposite of what I would think they are. Because I want to go down, I would go down the sign that says down.
about to die anyway. Ah, ah, and I'm getting my directions messed up again. Yeah, and the frustrating thing is that I'm gonna have to restart this whole dungeon again if I die. I need you to give me food, not money. Not enough food. this restoring my health? enough So going the opposite way that the sign says on the stairs, that is something important to notice. Oh, thank you, I need food. Oh, and now that I've made it to the boss floor, I don't have to go through the whole dungeon again. That is a relief. I can just teleport straight here for the boss fight. So if I die in the boss fight and end up rage quitting, I can just come straight back to the boss fight later. That's, so that's really nice. But those stairs, that's a pretty important issue. Um, the signs are backwards on the stairs from what they should be. I'm gonna clip that too, so that um, I'm thinking I need to go, th these are the stairs to go down, but they're actually the stairs to go up because that sign says down. And so I was going the opposite way and I was getting lost. I, I was going to the wrong floor because I was reading the sign and trying to go the way the sign was saying. Um, so that is an important mental model to think about with players and see, does anyone else have this issue? I don't remember ever having this issue before. Um, so I'm not sure. She's weak and I'm going to switch to this dude to see if that helps anything. Wait, what level is she now, D? Because he's got quest two. Yeah. I like these melee fighters way better than ranged fighters. Of course, the benefit of the ranged fighter is you have to fight smarter. 
but sometimes you just want to benefit from an OP player, a character. And I'm guessing, nope. Is that the final boss? That was the right dude to choose for the job. Okay. So that's the whole part of this game is to figure out which one's going to be the best for the job. Which form. I can buy some more stat stuff. And I can power up something. Let's see, what do I want to power up? Now this is another important thing. You pay attention to their UI here. I like their UI quite a bit. It's fun, it's interesting, and they use good symbols to help you know what's going on. At least I can understand clearly what's going on. Of course, again, I always do user testing on usability testing on things to make sure that it's going to work for your target audience. But um, the UI is fun. What I wished, because I'm having to guess here, that I wished that they had which form was to the left, like put to the left of here. Which form is this one? Okay, so it does say. Once you hover over something, it does say down in the bottom right which form it is, but I think it would be better, because I'm just now noticing that, it would be better if you had the form to the left so that you could still see. And the symbols can be a little smaller to make that happen. Um, but, I mean, I'm noticing it now, so yeah, it's there in the bottom right, but it would be, I was expecting it in the left on the left, to the left of whichever one it is. Because on the top right, and again, I can't use my mouse because it doesn't show your mouse on this game. Um, so I can't show, use my mouse to show you, but it is, your current form is what's in the top right. And the stats are your current stats. But for the thing that you're wanting to level up, I would want it to be so I don't have to go off memory or, oh, it's down there in the bottom right. Um, have, it to the le have it to the left of the, have it in line with, over here to the left um, of this icon so that I can quickly see, oh, that's the rat, that's the knight, that's the archer. And I haven't unlocked any others yet. So I want to uh, upgrade that, I guess. And uh, I can still upgrade something else. Let me do 19 poison. On a cost goes down. I have 11 stars, so I still can't. And the Demi Dungeon, it was level 2 when I went in. I mean, level 1 when I went in, now it's level 2. So the, the level of the dungeon changes as you level up. Seems to be changing when you level up. And I like on the map, it shows that you've cleared that dungeon with this little green check mark. And I like the map design in general, because it's showing you where are these other little mini dungeons versus the major dungeons. So you'll see... I guess that one wasn't a major dungeon, um, but you see where you can go save. You see where the tre you saw. Where is it? Is there a treasure one here that I can't get to right now? Nope. 
haven't got to. Nope. But it did show the treasure where it was located, which I totally appreciate. And it's showing you, I guess it's the level of the dungeon. So this is a major dungeon, I guess, because it needs... So you've got different signs here for, is this a major dungeon or a minor dungeon? And here's your fairy for your your key areas as a teleportation portal there, which I don't see any others right now, but there's one. And you can see where your shops are. So I like the design and you can see it looks like there's quests here. Um, so this red exclamation point is retrieve a gem shard and this quest is enter the castle dungeon but you need enough stars to do that I almost have enough um, and when you hover over it I appreciate that if it's a key thing um, it tells you what it is if it's associated with a quest it tells you which quest it is So, and it's fun that it's just a hand-drawn map. It's just, doesn't have to be perfect, beautiful design. And this design actually reminds me of platformer games or the older, older school games that you play. Side-scrolling for your console and your little handheld um, portable game. So that's like your Vita and so forth. Um, so it's a nice nostalgic design there. And I can clearly see where I haven't gone yet, but I can't go there because I can't go in the water. And I can't go there because I can't go in the water. So there are areas of the map that aren't open to me yet. I haven't gone down here yet, so I should try going down there. So I need to continue leveling up anyway and getting more stars anyway. And that requires doing these little mini quests for the characters, like fighting stuff. So I still need to continue doing that anyway. Well, there's one down. And that was enough to help me level up. Yeah, I like this game. Um, it's not specifically a platformer game, but it feels like one, kind of. feels like one just because of the design of the map, even though it's not technically one. It's not one. Huh. I don't know how the Eastern Gate Guard does it, but over here we follow orders. No exceptions, not even for fellow members of the Guard. So I guess that's an area that I'm not ready for yet. So it's nice that they keep you out of those areas if you if they think that you're too... Or it's, it's either because you're too low or because um, you almost have enough stars. Or because the MSQ, ha you haven't finished something you need to in the MSQ yet to um, get go to that part of the dungeon or, or the map. It 
has it's kind of has an open world feel too just because you can run around on the map and kill stuff out in the world versus going to the dungeons did i already do this one nope oh yeah i did okay Let's see about this dungeon. She needs to be a C. He needs to be a C. Let's do this dungeon and then, or a little bit. Let's see how far I get. Um, And then we'll do our rose thorn bud. Horses. Oh, I leveled up. Nice. And I unlocked horse. Yay. <laughs> Keep back unlocked. So, do I want to try it yet? Let me finish the fight I'm in the middle of. And then I will. Try horsey. So it's the same behavior as the ranger. You have to face a certain way and you can use lock. Okay. Yeah. But again, you have to think about it. far back the horse pushes them. It's like, get away from me. <laughs> so you can't power up this kick. is fun. So they make something fun about each class and now that 
mean, I don't hate the ranger as much as I did before, but I still don't like the ranger as much just because it's so weak. I die too easily. But it, it, if I use a strategy, I can get around that. I like the horse. Horse is OP. I like OP. And for those new to gaming, OP means overpowered. It's just a little frustrating getting it in the right angle. That looks like a place I don't want to go. <laughs> yeah. Gallop. Hold to zoom forward, trampling anyone in your way. Cost 30 mana. Move speed is up, though. Okay, so you fight each mini boss to unlock the next area. Okay. Oh, okay, now I can go this way. Now I have enough to go into the big dungeon. We're not going to do it because it's already after two, but now I have enough to go in there. Horse is OP. And I've made it to the guessing this is the boss fight. Okay. Boss fight time. Okay, 
level up, please? Nope. No level up. But I am getting a lot of forum points, so that does help. Level up in a way. I'm using the... Yeah, that gallop one where it turns yellow. I like that it indicates what form you're using. Oh, hey. That was it. Oh, I have 19. And I just let all the horses free, yay. The horse lets out a whinny. You whinny back. You're happy to help. And now I can power up some stuff too. Let's see, I don't want to power up that horsey. I'm just thinking, what do I want? Oh, I can upgrade this slab to a sad little slappy poo plus 20 mana. It's still a sad little slappy poo, though. So what do I want to level up? Oh, I have a new quest called Unbridled Love. Fall in love. Alright, so I have to st stay a horse? No, I don't have to stay a horse. I think I do for the quest, but... The scene transitions are fun. Save that. The stallion looks happy to see a new face. The horse offers you some cud, but you aren't in the mood. <laughs> this horse gives a subtle nod of recognition. There's an exclamation point above the NPC of the quest. So that is a clear sign, indicator of quest. And you'll see that the um, map also changed to... Um, say I cleared it, which is nice. I like that it shows on the map where the dungeons are that I cleared. Now this is the horse. Your horsey eyes have never beheld such beauty. Nervously, you distract yourself by eating some grass, but the majestic stud has the same idea. As you dip your heads, your moist noses touch. You raise your eyes to meet his, and the feeling is electricity. This is the horse you've been waiting for, the stallion you've dreamed of your whole horsey life. Of all the strange feelings that come with being a horse, the one feeling you never expected was love. That was an easy quest to get a star. That's funny. Okay, so now let's go ahead and do the, let me save. Now we'll go ahead and do the Rose Thorn Bud for this, since it is, and I'm trying to remember how to get to the quit. Um, I hit the touchpad. Yes, so that was, do you, are you sure you want to stop? So that's a good, um, oh, what is that? Air recovery, prevention and recovery. Okay, so let's get to the Rose Thorn Bud for today. And... Okay, so some of the roses were artwork, artwork style, I can't spell, artwork style, um, I 
I gotta say, it's a fun artwork, so. Like the maps, the, the area maps are hand-drawn. Um, fun graphics when you level up. And unlock a new form. Um, let's see. Can change forms to get better benefits and battles. Um, depending on battle situation, I'm sure there's a better way of saying that. But as you can see in the Rose Thorn Bud method, if you haven't seen me do this before, I make very short little notes. It's not a dissertation. I'm not writing a whole lot on each one. It's keeping the points very short and simple for a quick scanning, quick discussion. Um, not again, not going into a ton of detail because that can be handled later when you're doing your next step if there's something next step that needs to be done. But for the most part, um, yeah, just keep it short and simple. If you're thinking about the restriction of the post-it and that's one of the reasons I do the post-its is so that we don't do a dissertation. It's just very short and simple um, going through each point and keeping a one point per post-it. Um, what were some of the other things? Music. It creates a great uh, atmosphere. Um, the tone of the characters is, I, know, I keep saying fun. Is there something I can say better than fun? But it, I mean, that's part of the whole goal is to make it fun. But why is it fun? Um, tone of the characters it's, it's, it's humorous and more I think it's, it's hard to, to it's hard to say what it is but it's more like um, you know in a lot of games all the a lot of the characters are just like the hero type but in this one it, uh, it's like it's like kind of non-hero you're nobody um, you're a nobody and that's more relatable right yeah it, it it's more relatable than your normal, like, hero types that you have in video games. That's what I'm trying to get at, I guess. Uh, and this also, um, so the, uh, did I already say the UI? I like the UI design. Um, design is clear and, uh, Oh, uh, what, what would the word be? It's not, not so much relaxed as this. Uh, it, uh, well, it matches the tone of the artwork, of the res of the graphics, you know, the of the the world. It, it, it fits well. It's that feel and polish of the game. And a lot of games don't do that. Um, you'll see incredibly, like, not very well thought out UI. That it, is, it can be ugly. It doesn't fit the rest of the game at all in the style. 
it's just like an afterthought. It's like we need this UI to make it um, playable, but I care more about a lot of game developers care more about the environment and the mechanics of the game and not as much about the graphics, the UI, to the UX side of it. And that's where you get a lot of problems with game design. And UI design is a big part of it. And getting your UI to feel like the rest of your game is important for that polish of the game and that tone of the game and the atmosphere that you're trying to create. Everything goes together. Your sound, your sound effects, your audio, your voice acting if you have any, your graphics, your character design, your UI design, all of it, your NPC behaviors, all of it goes together to make a good game and make a game feel whether or not it's been thought out and polished versus there are a lot of games out there, like I said, that UI was obviously an afterthought because they didn't put, they didn't even put a lot of design thought into the visual design. But then there are some that put a lot of thought into the visual design and it's very cool looking, but isn't actually easy to use. So your user experience, it's very important to have people who know how to do user research, usability research and user testing, usability testing and things like that to really make your game feel polished and well thought out and well designed and well executed. And this game for the most part is very good. I really like this game. Um, I like the music, I like the tone, uh, the atmosphere and this, uh, it's cute and gross at the same time because you've got all these bugs flying everywhere around this rotting food uh, that you see in the background. And I guess you can't see it through my camera. Let me turn off my camera real quick so you can see it. There, bugs on rotting food. It's gross, but it's also cute. Um, so, a lot of good things. Uh, this game makes me want to try. So this is a very important thing. So this game makes me want to try their other games. And that's Dreambox. Uh, is the name of the game developer, I believe, for this one. Let me double check real quick. Yeah, Drinkbox Studios. So that right there is a win. That is a big win. This is saying they're actually wanting to try out our other games and they're actually wanting to spend money on our other games. So that is a good design. That is a successful design. So now there were still some thorns, uh, potential buds and uh, I, um, again, don't want to spend a horrible amount of time on this, so let's just, those were the big things that stood out to me. Um, did I already say you can change forms? Yes. Okay. And again, if you're watching this later, if you're watching this now, go ahead and add comments. What do you think could be added to this Rose Thorn Bud if you're watching? Um, give me some feedback in the chat. Let me know, if, is there something that you think I should add that I haven't added to Rose's? Um, but I'm going to move on to Thorns um, while you're doing that, if you're watching. Or if you're watching this later on YouTube, don't think that just because the stream's over that you can't participate. Go ahead, go ahead and make your comments in the chat, um, in the comments in the YouTube video. And I do check the comments. I do look at them. And if you have some questions or something, I will respond to you. Um, go ahead and do that. I want to. I want this to be, even though you're not watching it live, I still want you to be able to benefit from it. So go ahead and do that. Feel free to do that. Um, so thorns. I wrote a couple down um, so I wouldn't forget them. So the, which section of the game it is, was that in? Let me look real quick. Um, the options versus controls menu. Well, that was another thing. Um, expected controls to be where I set up controls, controller options. Um, and I can't spell anything. Um, but just showed which controls 
do what? And um, this is like a said a subcategory I had to go to options to change control and then switch back to control to see the changes like switching back and forth between menu items that's that's what we would call a um, what, what category did that go under that went under what's the, what's the word she used here um, workload uh, minimum workload so how much effort did it take me I have to switch back and forth between the screens to see what effect my change just had on the game instead of just showing it in the game and so then that would be a bud that we'll get to in a minute. Uh, well, I'll go ahead and do it now because I'm thinking about it. Um, so it's fine. You don't have to be fully structured. You can go back and forth between them as you're thinking about them so you don't forget them. It's fine to do that. It's not, there's not rules around how you do this. I do it. I like to think structured, but it's, you don't have to do that. You can go back and forth, but just try to make sure that you put things in the right categories because it's very beneficial to, for clear communication, first of all, and to make it clear what your next steps are gonna be um, in this case. So, I and I didn't talk about what these categories mean for anyone that's new to it. I apologize for that, we'll do that right now. Uh, I'm using yellow roses because I have a mental model of uh, generally they make them pink or red but pink and red and I have a mental model as a UX researcher that red or pink means a pain pain point so my brain automatically reads it as a pain point or something bad so I've changed it to where and the same for green because they would put thorns as green which is opposite of my mental model. Green means good. So I changed up the colors um, just because my mental model is that red is pain, green is good, and then buds. I don't even remember what color they made buds, but I've changed it to match my mental model. So yellow um, roses, because these are just notes, these are good. I mean, it could have been a different color, but then Think about legibility of your colors because on here there you only have so many options and these darker ones are harder to read. So um, the color contrast gets into the weird areas when you get into these colors. So I just stick with yellow just for legibility. And then so roses are what went well, what's a highlight, what did you like? So these are the good things like... Um, the, yeah, the quests are different. It's like humorous side quests like uh, the love, like the unbridled love one. Um, those are humorous and different. And then thorns are what didn't go well, what was the low point, what did you not like? I was trying to think, oh, I went quiet because I was trying to think if I had done any other side quests yet. I don't think I had. I don't think I had. I don't remember. Um, but they are fun, humorous side quests that aren't like your normal go fetch and grab side quests. They're different, uh, which is good. Um... Yeah, I guess I'll add that. Not standard fetch. Fetch and retrieve. Side quests. Well, fine. So short. Um, 
So, and then buds are what opportunities do you see? What would you do differently next time? What questions do you have? So these buds are not only just opportunities for how you would do something different, but it's also what are your next steps? What do we need to follow up on? Is there anything we need to look into to follow up on to investigate? Because we can't assume things just in the beginning. We have to investigate sometimes on why's, why something's a certain way or investigate is that a bug like what I was talking about earlier and we'll get into that in a second but this is your and putting things in the right categories makes you have a very clear distinction of what are your next steps and you get alignment with your team on okay this is what we have to work on next um, and prioritize that and so forth and that can, that can be a separate exercise where you go into prioritization of next steps an assignment of next steps. That would be something you would do as a team together too, after you're done with your rose thorn bud or whatever method it is you're using. So what was I gonna say? So I had to go put them together, yeah. Together, togetting in one place instead of switching back and forth. I'm going to map that to that so you know that that bud goes with that thorn. And it's fine to show what controllers do what, because that's how I was able to verify that um, I had the right controller setting, which was one of the other thorns, was that... Um, the right color nope that's a different color some of these are just really close in color together which makes it also hard so if think about your color coding as well when you're doing these give them enough contrast so that and these two I'm not even sure if these do have enough contrast but for people with color blindness if you're color coding stuff um, like I have the heading here um, can I just make that? Yeah, I can. Okay, cool. Um, make sure that there are other indicators besides just color so that people with color blindness or vision issues can still um, did the whole thing. Yeah. Um, can know what's going on without just relying on color. Okay. Thorns, so there was that uh, controllers uh, picking the picking the controller where you are picking the controller, and we don't have to know the details. We can just quickly note it. But I was thinking of going back and double checking what was that called. But I can do that later. So the word, you don't have to do that if you're in a meeting. Um, you can if you want, but for time's sake, you don't have to go in and do that and double check that. That can be a next step. Um, part of the next step is double checking what that's called. But so the problem that I was having was the controller type, and picking the right controller type. Um, it was under options and I talked about it on the stream. And again, if you're watching and you have any more things to add to the Rose Thorn Bud, or you're watching later, add your comments. And I do check them, so go ahead and add them. Um, there might be a delay on the live stream that I may not see it right away, but if you do have some to add, go ahead and do that. Um, feel free to do that. That's the whole point of this, what I'm trying to get to here is that participation from you guys in the audience so that we can do this together and learn together and you actually gain experience doing this and that's only beneficial for you um, so controller type was hard wasn't clear Type 1, 
type 2, type 3. It's like, oh, doesn't even, what does that even mean? It's like, okay. And so that would be where I would say one of the benefits of having these two things together would be to help solve that problem instead of having to switch back and forth. But another thing would be to just go ahead and either use controller na type names like Sony Xbox or show image with the option. Yeah. Or show an image of the controller. So that it's clear which one they which one you're picking instead of just doing type one, type two, type three. And then another one was a potential bug. And I'm just gonna say potential bug. And that was when um, in the first dungeon. So in that little prison cell and first dungeon Which quest was it? When, when was that happening? It was at the final boss and then that first area where the, I'm gonna have to use more than one tab or more than one post-it here, but I'll just connect them like I'm doing here. So visually, you know, they're together. Um, grouping is a visual design indicator of what's together and what's not. Um, for those that are new to design. Um, it was when the pop-up opens to um, tell you to, what's it telling you to do? Pop-up tells you to use A, a controller button that looks like touchpad, but isn't, and doesn't in normal way. And then L2 no longer works to open the menu and have to use the tab on the keyboard to open the menu. And the L2 also also disappears from the map, from the mini map. L2 icon when this is happening. This is a potential bug. If it's not a bug, I hope it's a bug. If it's not a bug, they need to fix that. Either way, they need to fix that. Um, because if I hadn't known to use the tab, on the keyboard, I would have been stuck, unable to progress. So that's a problem. And that would have potentially ended in a rage quit. Um, so take that seriously. So if it's a bug, yeah, fix the bug. Um, here, let's see, let me think about this. 
Um, and then this will be all we can do for this session. But pop-up tells you to use a controller, so match icons to right to correct controller. That's first and foremost. Um, but let's see. I think it's a bug. I hope it's a bug. Next step. Investigate. And try to replicate. To see if that's really what's happening. And so what I'm saying here um, is... And I'm gonna... I may try to replicate this later if I have time. Or if someone else is interested in doing that. Um, but what you would generally do in bug testing would be to try to replicate that. And so they need as much information as they can get on that. And I do have video footage, so I could... Um, so next step would be to investigate, try to replicate, and... Um, let me separate those so they're not together. And um, grab video footage clip to share with the devs. So this is what you would want to do if you are working on a project with your team or something, or you are viewing a build that your developers have created for you, is that if you have a potential bug or an issue with the build, you would most likely come across something. So what you would want to do is try to get as much detail about what was going on. And also, this is another benefit of recording yourself when you're going through your builds or your your prototypes. Or builds is what I mean by build is the n latest version of the game that you're reviewing with your team to, um, or even during usability testing. If you if you come across something weird like this, you want to record your walkthroughs, your testing of these things so that you can grab your clips to share with the devs so they can see what happened and they can try to replicate it. And then if they can replicate it, then they can fix it. But if they can't replicate it, that makes it very hard for them to fix it. So, uh, because they don't, they, it's harder to figure out what's going on if they can't replicate it. So, um, document as much as you can about it. I do have, again, the video clip. And that would help figure out what's going, help them figure out what's going on, and prove that it actually happened. Because <laughs> I am the one, I am, I apparently have the touch, and I can make weird things happen to games that nobody can replicate. And I at least have footage to prove that it actually happened, and I wasn't imagining it. And it's possible that I was, and I can go back and review for my own sanity to see did that actually happen or not. Um, so, I think that's an, that is enough Rose Thorn Bud, so let's think about how we would translate a game like this into XR, because that is what we're talking about here, that's the whole point of our thing, is besides the gaming UX aspect, how would this translate into XR? Could we make a game like this in XR, should we? So the, the art style, I don't think anything really has to change with the art style, um, I don't think anything really has to change with the art style. You could even do 2D art um, and animated, and it could still look very interesting. I've seen it done. Um, I'm staring into space because I'm thinking. Um, I've seen it done, and it can be... It can still be a very immersive and cool experience, even with 2D art. So the art style doesn't really have to change can still be and on maps and character design same character design um, the so like you c can create an immersive experience with 2d art uh, it is possible, and it can be very creative in a very different feel, which is a good potential. It doesn't have to be 3D art. Um, 
but you want to use it well and think about it well. So what would you think about? You... you it would have to be thought through, and we don't have a lot of time right now to do that, but um, you would just think through <laughs> things like placement, um, element of elements, um, distant versus near. So if it's something that's in the distance, um, things in it at a distance um, and they do that now. Even uh, things that are in the far distance can be a flat image instead of a model. It saves on performance in the VR simulations like the things in the background to be 2d images placed in um 3d space at dif distances kind of like they did the old school um, animation with the cells that the plates that were placed in front of each other to create that parallax effect you can do that in vr too um, for your things that are in the distance how do you spell parallax i don't know how to spell parallax I don't know how to spell parallax. Hmm. Um, and so as far as action for battles and stuff, um, NPC behaviors, you would think about the placement of the, um, dialogue panels in relation to NPCs. Um, maybe they're maybe instead of at the bottom of the screen because there's no screen. There's no screen in. No frame. Um, you would you would think about it, where is it in relation to the actual NPC so if it's above the head Just maybe just below eye level. From like mid to torso. It depends. Or just at or below eye level in proximity to to the NPC. You would you'd have to think about it. You'd have to explore that explore placement to see um, what's not obtrusive but still usable and in comfortable viewing ranges comfortable head zones here and and viewing ranges to think that think about that and I would think that you wouldn't want it above their heads because then people are looking up a lot and that can cause neck strain so think about it ergonomically um, how you would place that you don't want it stuck to the HUD don't stick things to the HUD um, that is annoying don't do that um, and I have a whole I think I have an article on that somewhere yes I do I have a video on it too I will I talk about it in bifocals and trifocals, uh, um, like correct corrective lenses. I will try to remember to 
link that in the video later. Um, I'll talk about it in there, why you don't want to stick things to a HUD. And now another thing that you would want to think about is the action. So um, fighting, moving around, locomotion types. Is your character... So like in this game, if your character, if you're first person, you can't see all the cool forms. So maybe you might consider trying a, um, a scene set up like Moss, where you can see Quill, or you can see the character, and you can move it around, but you're still immersed. Um, And since this does kind of have a platformer vibe, even though it's not a platformer, that could still work because Moss is a platformer in VR. Um, so, yeah. And then if you do that, then that's gonna handle, that will handle the issues of uh, locomotion during battles and the feel of the gameplay. Um, and then that's for VR. So what about mixed reality? This is something that you would wanna play on a mixed reality headset. think about the future of headsets. Would you want to do that? I can see potential if it is, if it is like scaled down to fit on a tabletop or surface and then it can still be in 3d um, not sure you would want to like immerse the world with a mixed reality because uh, again think about the application and how they um, how it relates to their environment. Because then why would you do that, not just do a VR? Um, so think about what's the benefit of mixed reality. this game in MR. What would be the benefit? If there is, if you can see one, if you study people's behaviors, and we don't have this yet because MR headsets aren't mainstream yet. So it'll take time to understand people's will adapt this tech to everyday lives. We don't know yet. Um, so that one would be a future one. Not ready yet. I mean, if you want to experiment though with it, go ahead and do that. That would be great. If you've got access to MR headsets and you can test with people, do it. And you have the time and the budget. Um, 
So that is all I have to for today. Again, if you watch this later on demand, feel free to add your comments. Are there things that, are there questions that you have uh, about UX for XR or for game in UX um, or this Rose Thorn Bud method? Is there something that you want to add to this Rose Thorn Bud exercise? Because again, I want you to learn and practice doing this so that you can take this into your real world projects you can gain this experience because that's just going to be beneficial for you in the real world and in trying to get jobs if you're trying to get a job things like that these are useful beneficial skills that will help you with your teamwork and help you on your project teams so please do get involved in it and um Add your comments on YouTube later. It doesn't have to be real time if you're not here on the Twitch stream. I do encourage you to join the Twitch stream so that you can practice and discuss in real time. But if you can't, that doesn't mean you don't have a chance. Add your comments to YouTube and we'll work on it. Um, I, I do check them again. And if you like what you're seeing here, uh, please like um, the videos on YouTube, subscribe to YouTube, follow me here on Twitch, um, tell your friends, tell your any teams that you know about these things. Hey, these are beneficial. My goal here is to help you gain actual experience that um, you're not going to get unless you have a job, but you can gain some experience here doing this with me. So go ahead and please do tell your friends, tell your teams even if you're already on a team, if you want to learn these methods, come watch, watch them later on demand, participate in the comments and in the chat so that we can learn together. And again, if you want to talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, uh, go ahead. And I do have these labs on Tuesdays, Thursdays for free, 12 p.m. Central and right now on Twitch and we're ending this one but I also have set up office hours on Tuesdays if you'd like to have some time with me you can book some time with me to learn more at bring your questions and talk to me um, and that is on my website pint size robot ninja let me see if that works on here um, adding it to here pint size robot ninja .com. and thank you for watching today and I will see you next week for our next game have a good rest of your week <laughs>